Welcome into Other People's Shoes, the podcast where listeners get to step into the lives of others and see the world through their shoes. Your host, Neil Matthews, is a seasoned interviewer who has a natural talent for empathizing with his guests and drawing out their unique perspectives. Through a combination of storytelling and insightful questioning, Other People's Shoes explores the lives of a diverse range of guests, from everyday people to celebrities and thought leaders. With a warm and welcoming style, Neil creates a safe and supportive space for his guests to share their stories, while also challenging listeners to broaden their perspective and think more deeply about the world around them. So tune in to Other People's Shoes with Neil Matthews and get ready to step into other people's shoes. Hey, come take a walk with me, not like you used to do. Do something different and put yourself in other people's shoes. Open up your mind and open up your eyes and change your direction, change your perspective. Welcome into Other People's Shoes. I am your host, Neil Matthews. Thank you for hitting play today. Super excited you've chosen to do that. Listen, you could have been chosen to do so many other things. I'm, I'm trying to think of something exciting that you could have done. You could have organized your closet. By the way, I, I look behind me and, and my closet is in disarray still. There are shoes everywhere. You guys have finally met Elizabeth, so now I can really feel like I can talk about her a lot. By the way, her episode is still getting rave reviews. So if you haven't had a chance, go back and take a listen to that. It is our season finale of season 13. We call it the Quiz Prince. But speaking of a conversation that might raise some question marks and some quizzing on my side of things from the tribe, the circle, the whatever you call yourselves, I, I don't know, the, the shoelaces, we maybe need to come up with a name for you folks. We have actually an opportunity right now to sit with a gentleman that I got to be candid with you. I am fascinated by. We sort of met on this crazy website called Podmatch. So if you're a podcast, Podcaster, you may want to check that out. If you're not a podcaster and you want to get on podcasts, also you might want to check that out. But in this dynamic, I immediately comes across the desk and it and it's this weird dynamic for me. So I'm gonna just put it out there and you guys digest this. And here it is: gay Christian or Christian that's gay. How do we struggle? What do we do with that? Well, luckily for all of us, we have a gentleman right now that can maybe dive into that conversation and is willing to step into that conversation. So help me welcome in my new friend. Friend, Brian. Brian, how are you today? I'm so good. How are you doing, Neil? Good. Nice little monologue there. <laughs> no, it was good. It was a good lead up. I'm always nervous about those because, you know, I, some people want this illustrious fanfare and all this other stuff. I'm like, you know what? It's my show. I, I do my own monologue. So there we are. <laughs> it always weaves back into them. I don't know why they get a little weird about it. I've had some publicists say, you have to read this and this script only when you introduce our guest. Yes, yes. And I love that you mentioned Podmatch. That was like uh, my marketing guy is like, hey, we should try this pod match. I'm like, what the heck is that? It's like, it's a pod matchmaking service. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and then that's how we found each other. I am on the free version. So if pod match wants to kick down a, a full year, how did I miss the free version? I'm paying for it. You're paying for it? Well, that's silly you. <laughs> I mean, I'm willing to pay for it. Listen, I'm, I, I'll pay for things. Sometimes it's weird to pay for things that you're like, is there any ROI on that? That's return on investment for those <laughs> yes. non-salespeople. Well, out there, so. here's your ROI right here. ROI on zero. <laughs> right? <laughs> but we still connected, even though you have a paid and, and I don't. Yes, so that's yes. what's so great about Podmatch. So anyway, there we are. Brian, getting into you, I would love to yeah. more, know more of your story, but we got to lead off the show with my very favorite question of all time to give people. And that's this. Brian, what size shoes do you wear? Oh, the jury's still out. Either nine or nine and a half. It depends. I err towards nine and a half because my feet are a little bit wider than normal. I'm probably a true nine wide. So nine wide. All right. Now this is my favorite part of that second part of that question. And that's this. What brand or style are we wearing today? Uh, probably the bet. Well, right now I'm wearing my socks because it's the morning. <laughs> so what are you talking about? If I were to be wearing shoes, hmm. I don't think I'm a brand guy. I'm more of a style guy. Italy. I just, I fell in love with Italy in high school. I I'm not some big global traveler. It was just the first time I experienced life outside of the great United States. And I've been going back there almost every year since. Usually if I could put on a pair of shoes made from Italy, I'm pretty happy. 
So are they like a dress shoe? Or is it like a running shoe? All the above. All the above. Like Italy doesn't just make fancy leather shoes. Like they make cool, like casual kickers too. Well, so no Jordans in the closet. No, no, never, never. Well, not never, but never, not really. Like Fifle, like never say never. Probably not ever. Well, I'm a Jordan brand guy. I keep lobbying that maybe they'll kick me down some dollar ship for sponsorship. My phone is yet to ring. Maybe one day. But I've been through Atlanta. Speaking of where you're from, so I've been through Atlanta airport. Hasn't like everyone been through the Atlanta well, airport? Well, that's what Come I was on, wondering. Huh? Does that count that I was in Georgia, by <laughs> the way, if I've been through the Atlanta airport? I didn't mean to discount your experience. I'm just saying. Wow. Like you. I thought you already were hating. <laughs> Everybody comes through our airport. It's the biggest airport i think in the world i don't know what your experience was but i think it's arguably efficient for being such a huge airport i remember it being pretty efficient and i remember seeing a lot of yellow jackets georgia tech type stuff uh, yeah that's what yeah. i mean by yellow jackets mm -hmm. and my niece is actually going out to georgia right now she's a georgia bulldog back to you so here's my question we're just gonna jump in the water deep in here we come diving board not necessary we're just gonna come in right off the side of the pool and get right into the water that sounds more exciting like cannonball style and I gotta be candid. When I first heard or started seeing some of your stuff, I'm like, okay. I grew up in the church. Mm -hmm. Was an Awana kid, walked the aisle, Southern Baptist Church. That's in my roots as well. Became a pastor, studied the Bible pretty thoroughly. Some would say I, I have close to like an associate's degree in biblical studies, which by the way, does not transfer into like real world <laughs> applications. I do have some schooling behind me. You know a thing or two. Yeah, I do know a thing or two. And I've read my Bible a few times. And my mother-in-law, who has also been a past guest, told her she's part of that tribe that we talked about in the green room. When I told her you were coming on, she said, yeah, I don't know about that. And when I asked a couple of my friends again, you know, very close friends, I said, hey, what do you guys think of this? And they're like, yeah, I, I don't know about that. And I said, yeah, I don't either. I, I don't know. And, and this is not my seat of judgment. Yep. I'm trying to understand how when I read my Bible and I hear the words of Paul, Paul being the writer of the New Testament, majority of the New Testament, he says, listen, flee from all sexual immorality. Romans chapter one talks about you know people leaving their natural desires for unnatural desires. And I'm like, I don't understand that. Brian's going to have to help me understand that. So that's my first question. How do I understand that in light of your situation? I almost want to go back to the response of your friends, which is a real natural response. And there's two ways that you could look at the expression, I don't know about that. I don't know about that could be how it sounds, which maybe it wasn't, but it could be a sideways way of saying, well, I think I really do know about that. So I don't really know about that. I don't think that's okay. Or it could be more of a curiosity thing of, I don't know about that. I want to learn about that, right? Which is kind of the spirit of your show, which is cool. So I'm going to assume that the intention is more of the latter curiosity and getting to understand each other. As far as the Bible goes, it's interesting. I'm not going to have a whole lot to say about that. So I might disappoint you. And what I mean by that is the reason that I'm kind of out there with my story and with the stories of others is to really create some empathy and to help people know about that. Just to know about the experience of folks that identify as gay or lesbian or or transgender, or any letter in that wonderful long line, which we got to come up with an umbrella word for that. By the way, I agreed on that. I can't say it without <laughs> laughing. And and, I, and listen, when I, when I, the alphabet soup is the I alphabet often what soup, I call totally. it. That's exactly what I'm trying to say is, is that I feel yeah. like this is an eggshell conversation. I don't yeah, want to break yeah. any of those eggshells. And, and I'm glad to be candid. Again, you and I talked ahead of time. You're going to yep. be open. You're going to just share what we share. And, and there is this openness between us that we're going to try not to offend, not on purpose, but w and, and you're open to that. That's kind of the little disclaimer. Yeah. Yeah, and that's where we talked about that prepping for the call. It's like that's a really natural aversion of folks that may be curious to step in and to learn more. They don't want to, you know, offend anybody or say something wrong to which I said, hey, you know, if you come into the room with sort of mutual respect and, and don't have an agenda and you really just want to get to know somebody, you can't see anything wrong, in my opinion. And that's the space you're coming from. Back to the Bible verses. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to disappoint. I think you'll learn and probably more by the end of this call that where I'm coming from is I think that we can agree to disagree on those things because I think there's a more important conversation. And what I mean by that, we do get hung up on verses and scriptures and right and wrong and all and, and sort of the moral, ethical considerations of sexuality, for example. And that 
has tended to be the conversation that has kind of hijacked all conversations around this stuff. And what I do try to do with folks, not, not that I don't think that that's a worthy pursuit, right? There are apologetists that can, that can talk about those verses in the Bible and argue for a traditional interpretation, pretty compelling arguments for a more progressive interpretation. I think you can land on any of those. My case is sort of like, I think that we've spun so much energy on those six verses or the Bible or the morality of this that we've missed a more important conversation, which is there's a group of people, LGBTQ plus in particular, that statistically and historically have um, pretty negative experience with the church. And because of that, they don't want to have anything to do with God. And I, that breaks my heart. And I think that breaks God's heart. And so I try to encourage people to elevate and pivot the conversation over there and agree to disagree on some biblical stuff. I look at homosexuality as a sin. Mm -hmm. No different than gossip, no mm -hmm. different than a guy sitting in jail right now who murdered somebody, mm -hmm. no different than an individual who may have raped somebody who molested a child. Mm -hmm. I look at it, sin is sin is sin. There's no rating system. How do you respond to that? I, I usually just say you're entitled to that interpretation, and it's important to know that there are other folks that don't see it that way. And so you just have to sort of decide, what am I going to do with that? Am I going to dig my heels in and win some, and not that you're trying to, but win some argument about is it sin or is it not sin? And if that's okay, if that's where you want to be and you want to dig your heels in on that, then you can do that. But what I invite you to and others to is to say, just for a minute, come over here and look at something that I think is really going to break your heart. And when you do that and you immerse yourself in that and the stories of folks that would love to reclaim their faith, be welcome into a community and church and God and get their spirituality back. I would argue that you immerse yourself in those stories enough to go, you know what? I think I can agree to disagree on that because I care about this. Sometimes we have to set even quote unquote sin aside mm -hmm. to really look at the individual and see what their need is and mm -hmm. how you can minister to them. Because I think mm -hmm. even Jesus himself kind of set some stuff aside, didn't overlook who they were or what they were doing, but said, you know what? I'm going to see you as the person. Mm -hmm. You know, a woman caught in the act of adultery comes to mind. My question, though, and, and maybe this is your community, and, and so maybe this is kind of a broader question, but it just seems to me some of these individuals who are part of the, can we call it the alphabet soup? I mean, I again, I I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I have a, I And have I'm going to butcher it every time no, I try no, 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 to say no. it. So I have this friend, too, that's so funny. She, I won't tell you her whole story, but what did she call it? The BLT group. <laughs> I mean... I like it. I, it's easier I, I to say. It's funny, but then that leaves out me. I'm the G. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> queer is coming back. The younger generation has sort of embraced queer. And when I hear like a 27 year old talk about queer and they say it and it sounds super positive, I like it. But then you and I probably come from a vintage where the word queer was very derogatory. Like, so no gay man wants to be called queer. So the jury's still out of queer is going to win. Folks my age don't like it. The younger folks think it's pretty awesome. So I mean, I remember playing a game called Smear the Queer. Smear the Queer. I want to minimize the folks that aren't cool with that word, because like if you got called queer growing up, that's not a really happy word. Times have changed. Language has changed, too. The struggle I've always had with that community maybe we'll just say that community and you and I both know that that's what we're talking about mm -hmm. is with that community. It seems like they always want to lead with their sexuality. Even in your case, Hey, I'm, I'm Brian, I'm gay and I'm a Christian. I don't lead with, hi, I'm Neil. I'm heterosexual. And I've been married 21 years to my high school. Suite. Like I don't lead with that. When I introduce mm -hmm. myself to folks, why do you think that community feels so challenged or want to push on that or has to lead with that part of that conversation? Two ways. I don't typically lead with that. I am in the public arena to some degree talking about what it's like to be gay and to love Jesus and to and to work with churches about conversations about that that are productive. So I do in that realm. In the rest of my realm, I don't. I'm just Brian and I'm a dude. And I would say most of my friends that are LGBTQ plus don't lead with that. So maybe the best answer to that is I think when, what you see sort of in the extremes and the headlines and the folks that are noisier, leading with that is the standard. I would not say that's the majority. It's probably just what you tend to see kind of out there. Most of us are kind of just normal people. But on the flip side of that answer, if folks are having to lead with that, it probably comes from a minority position. So if you were straight or white, you're in the majority, where if you are, if you were gay, then you might 
perceive yourself and you are statistically in the minority. And so it might be a way for you to try to overcome feeling marginalized is to really put it out there. So maybe folks that do that, that's really important to them. I wouldn't say that that's the majority of our community. I guess that's always the struggle for me. And I, and I love that what you were saying there is sometimes those are louder voices for whatever reason. They need yeah. to feel like they need to be amplified or you need to know this. And I mean, we could talk about Dylan Volvani. Like, I don't understand that. You want to transition. If you want to, like, if I want to woke up this morning and I said, hey, I'm going to go be a woman. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. I'm going to do that. But I don't understand why it has to be so publicly announced and this parade almost and larger than life needs to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I don't I don't get why it needs to be one, two, three. Look at me. Look at what I'm doing. I just don't understand that. If that's your choice, listen, fine. High five. I don't understand why it has to be such an attention grabbing thing, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. And I guess I would say the same as what I said before. I think folks that are needing to be out there front and center with their sexuality and put it in your face, maybe think about what's under the hood there. Maybe there's some hurt and there's some pain. And maybe if we sort of flip the narrative, of for a second to not be offended by that and to go, I wonder what's under the hood there that drives that. Then you're digging a little more at having some empathy and trying to help some healing and reconciliation occur. But I don't believe that's the majority. The folks that do do that, I would argue to a lot of my LGBTQ plus friends, that is a long Deal, isn't it? I told you it's really long. That's why I said your community. Can we just say that? Let's come up with it today, whatever it's going to be. We got to brainstorm on that. Before the end of the call, let's come up with an alternative to queer and LGBTQIA+. <laughs> I mean, is it bad to say alternative lifestyle? Yeah. Is that offensive? The, the term gay lifestyle is a misnomer. There's no such thing as a gay lifestyle. Just like there's no such thing as the straight lifestyle, if you think about it. I'm in this space where I'm gay and I love Jesus, and you may or may not agree with that. And But I get out there and I help people just sort of understand the story of folks who identify this way, really love Jesus and want to get back to that. How can we be a part of that? It may not be telling them they're in sin. It may be agreeing to disagree and helping heal hurts, especially younger folks, maybe in their 20s and 30s, who still have a fair amount of hurt that they maybe haven't resolved. And so how does that come out? That comes out as an edge. Or some of my friends that want to do good work in the church, in their family or something, I said, you know, it's probably, I think it's the first point of order is to go get whole first. Go do the work. Find people to help you do that for sure. When you're coming to try to advance good causes, but you still have a real chip on your shoulder of your perceived oppressor or your oppressor, it's probably not going to get a whole lot of work done. It's like going to be in your face. It's going to feel like an affront to you, where I'm hopeful that by the end of this call, you don't feel like I'm an affront to you. We can agree to disagree on a lot of things and learn from each other. That's what the show has been from the jump, is the idea that, again, we're in your shoes. That's why we asked that question mm -hmm. in the beginning. As, as silly and bizarre as it may sound, that's truly what we're at, is we really mm -hmm. want to be in those shoes. We want to be in those Italian shoes. <laughs> I want to go put on my favorite pair right now. I'm going to go grab my Jordans. <laughs> I would love to know this. Yeah. The origin story of coming out, is is that the right phrasing? Yeah. Yeah, I so, think so. So when did, when did that happen for Brian? If we can go back in the time machine, jump in the DeLorean, we'll kick out, you know, Doc Brown and Marty and, and yep. jump in the DeLorean. Yeah. What was that process like? And then maybe the revealing and all that, if you wouldn't mind sharing. I started recognizing that I was a little more attracted to the boys than the girls about the time you might expect. Good old puberty hits. It's not like this was like a, a new concept. I grew up in a pretty conservative evangelical church environment to which I still am today. And back then, you know, it's funny because I always had this really close relationship with Jesus. My my mom was awesome. Like she modeled, it wasn't about religion. It was about a relationship. Got that early on. I knew like Jesus was my friend and like it made sense to me. Even like six years old, I was trying to save people. And it was cool. It was a very relational thing from the beginning for whatever reason. And I felt like I could like confide in Jesus and God and in, in anything. He felt like a super safe place, which he is. 14 or 15 years rolled around and I was noticing the boys more than the girls. I didn't feel like God could deal with that. So I didn't address that at all. And maybe no surprise, that's a pretty taboo subject. And especially 30 years ago, really a taboo subject. So I spent most of my adult life not acting on that. 
think I did that because I was afraid of going to hell. I did it out of my fidelity to my relationship with God. I wanted to do the right thing. And so I remain single or celibate, if you want to call it, for the better part of my adult life. Dated some women, fell in love a couple of times. And then in my mid to late 30s, I met a dude, fell in love, and I really hadn't planned on that at all. But you can sit down across the table, the proverbial table with God, a 36-year-old old, old, a little differently than you could when you were 16. And I just, I, I was just like, you know what, God, like you've seen my life, you see my heart, you know, I want to do the right thing. I don't want a shortcut, but man, what am I supposed to do? And that became a couple of year wrestling match with God, kind of like Jacob, big old wrestling match with God for a couple of years. At the end of that two year wrestling match with God, I came to a point where I didn't necessarily have a new interpretation of six verses. I just felt God release me to say, you know what? You don't have to spend the rest of your life trying to fix your sexuality, staring at your navel. Just trust me. I got you. Didn't give me like permission to go get married yet or anything, but it gave me permission to quit thinking that the best way to honor God was to keep trying to fix my sexuality. And it was just a huge relief. And that, if anybody asked me when I came out, quote unquote, I point to that. What was it like telling mom and dad? That's the first first place I went. It's interesting. Great question too. Everybody knew the narrative of Brian prior to that. I was kind of like the hero, the Christian who denied his sexuality. And I don't mean to minimize that for anybody who feels like that's the best way to honor God. Of course, I respect that. I got plenty of friends that fall into that camp. Then I knew I was good with God. I'm like, oh, I got to go have integrity with people that know the different Brian. It was interesting where I went to my dad and dad was okay. Like, I mean, he didn't necessarily agree. He saw me. He saw my life. He knew I loved God. He knew I wanted to do the right thing. I wasn't looking for some shortcut on six verses. He said, you know, if you can look yourself in the mirror every day and know that you're doing the right thing and honoring God, then that is your call. He goes, the only problem is mom. (laughs) Because mom came from an evangelical background. She was very invested in the the Brian that didn't act on it. All of that. It was a tougher one with mom, for sure. Did she cry? Was there there any emotion? She was pissed. I was just going to ask, was she pissed? But I I was like, is that right to say here in this moment? I don't know. It's just funny. My mom doesn't get pissed real often, but she was real vested in, you know, that that was a big paradigm shift for her. It was a big paradigm shift for me. She was not cool with it. And we just kind of had to agree to disagree. That really is the best. Eventually, years later, she, I wouldn't say came around because she's still entitled to believe what she believes. She eventually just said, you know what? It's your life. And you, she wouldn't say it this way, but ultimately I'm accountable to God and to other people for my behavior, not her. It's not her job to determine what is sin or what isn't sin. For me, that's my I'm accountable to God for those things as as far as I see Christianity and salvation and all that. So she was able to just really let go of that and just say, you know, it's actually more important than I'm actually in your life. You know where I stand. So we don't need to keep talking about that every time we get together. (laughs) Let me agree to disagree and engage and be in your life. And so that was kind of her turning. I've heard people say when they finally make the decision to quote unquote come out. Now I feel bad about my closet reference being such a mess, you know. I wasn't trying to <laughs> insinuate anything by any means. But oh my God, that's hilarious. I, I just even, I just put that see, together. I didn't even think of that when you well, said that. Well, that's good. See? I'm glad because I wasn't insinuating that. <laughs> For the record, I met my wife at 17 and I can never imagine being attracted to another dude. I just can't. Like for me, that is so unnatural. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side of that, I have been around guys and I have seen them and I'm like, I love that trait about them. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's their heart or maybe it's the way they can fix things that I can't fix. Amazing that you can do that. Think of a Louis Giglio in your backyard is an amazing communicator. And I'm like, man, I love the fact that he can communicate God's word in an amazing way or even a great storyteller. That is a lovely trait that he has, but it isn't attract me to them in in a sexual way. And so that's the hard part for me is I just don't understand that. I just don't get it. Can you help me understand that? Yeah, I guess I would say you don't need to is my best answer. I understand your challenge, but I don't think you need to understand that. If you do, then maybe look at why you need to. It's just my experience. And it's just your experience. That's that's my best way to describe it. It's the most natural thing in the world for me to be attracted to dance. That's my experience. Love is so powerful. Mm-hmm. I remember growing up, youth kid, as I mentioned, 
Uh, yeah, we went too. to we went to Great America, which is in yeah. Santa Clara, I think it is. Right outside of Chicago, there was a Great yes, Marriott's exactly. Great America. Yes. They called and it so back Marriott's then. owned yes. it. Yeah, Didn't Six Flags yeah, buy probably. all of those. Yeah, yeah. You go to the one in Santa Clara now; it's not as stellar as it was back in the day. I went with our youth kids, and it was the first youth trip I had taken as as a quote unquote youth pastor. Most of my kids are Southern Oregon kids, which is super conservative, live in the valley most of their life. None of them have really seen quote unquote San Francisco or the bigger cities. Sure. We're in line for this ride called Drop Zone, which takes you up, I think, like sixty something feet up in the air, and it drops you. My wife hated the ride. I love the ride, even though I don't like heights. But I remember standing in line with one of our youth kids jason and he looks over and he's like dude trick it out and i was like what and i kind of look over and there was two guys kissing he's like man that's gross oh sick now to put it in context this is like early 2000s and i was like is that the first time you've ever seen that he goes yeah man oh man what is oh oh gross that moment i thought that's wrong that doesn't look right that picture doesn't look right it's almost like a picasso or a van gogh painting like i don't understand it doesn't look right and i thought okay that doesn't look right what do i do what do i tell him in this moment and to be candid i didn't tell him anything i just kind of changed the subject mm -hmm. i was like oh wow well, man look look at that over there you know kind of like a magic trick like don't look over there look over here what should i have said to him in that moment in your opinion i don't think you should have had an obligation to say anything in that moment like if you would have ran up and started punching him or something maybe but <laughs> i mean that was that was outside of the realm of his experience yeah maybe the reaction seemed judgmental but pretty rightfully so like He's never seen two dudes kissing. That would kind of freak me out if I'd never seen that either. I don't think that's a real violation. It just sort of speaks to if you're not around something like that. I guess the question is, fast forward to today, you can't not see that. It's, it's like it's everywhere. Like you have to flip a channel. or So with that, if there is a little more of not a normalcy to it, because LGBTQ plus folks still make up quite the minority in our population. I don't think you would have needed to say anything there, I guess, is my best answer. It's just his experience. And it's it was it's more like, what do you do with it? I've always thought back to that moment when I've encountered yeah. folks of the community, again, going back to our just till we can find a better word. I don't think you have to force yourself to be comfortable with something you're not. I challenge people to be uncomfortable with something they're not familiar with and they're not seeing. The name of my work is called Making Things Right. That connotates that something is wrong, but I'm not speaking to the wrongness potentially of LGBTQ plus behavior. That's a spec. I'm talking about the wrongness of that 86% of the LGBTQ plus community was raised in the church. And at the age of 18, 54% of them left, double the national average. Why? The number one reason, negative personal experiences. It didn't even show up on the list of the general U.S. population. And then when you ask those folks if they're open to returning to their faith roots, 76% say yes. That's compared to 9% of the general U.S. population. So what does that tell us? It tells us that there's a group of people that, for whatever reason, have really been hurt by the church and want nothing to do with God because of it. My invitation is, what do you want to do about that? That's all I'm talking about. The tension of whether you think gay is right or wrong can still exist. I don't go into churches and pastors and lead. I think that's why people talk to me because I'm not trying to convert their theology. I'm trying to help them shift their priorities and to, and to change and elevate the conversation to something that I think that matters a whole lot more. Well, and I respect that. Being the youngest of four in my house, it was hard to get seen. It was hard to get that attention. Mm. It was hard to get mom and dad to show up for who knows what. By the time it got mm. down to me, they were so exhausted. <laughs> they were almost divorced. Oh, it was rough. Yeah. And, and truly, I am seeing professionally counseling to help walk through those pain and that trauma. I, I hate to use that word trauma mm -hmm. very loosely because I know some folks that have been through way worse. And I think that's trauma. Yeah, yeah. What I walked through was not necessarily trauma. It was just pain. But My version, version of trauma, your for version. sure. But in that, I respect the fact of you going out and trying to find the unseen. I do, yeah. truly, Brian. Like, human being to human being, if we were in Atlanta together right now, I your coffee table, I would honest to God to tell you that. Because I think that is so wrong for us to overlook someone or not see them. And mm -hmm. so for me, I want you to know, I see you today. I respect what you're saying. I might not love it. I might not agree with it. That doesn't matter. But I respect you as a human being to say, hey, this is where we're at. Are you an Atlanta Falcons fan? Side note. Okay. Gosh, no. st still <laughs> still Chicago come on, Bulls. Come on. I'm a, I'm a gay dude. I don't <laughs> come on. Stop sports. it. No, that, that is a false I know is a it is, and I wasn't even going to go there, but... <laughs> 
to be honest, I'll watch football mostly for male bonding purposes. I don't love football. I'm really not stereotypical as a gay man in other ways, but yeah, I don't like sports. You've probably driven past the Mercedes-Benz <laughs> Stadium, though, in Atlanta, right? Oh, yeah. Do you know that they can actually see 78,347 people in that building? Do you know that? Woo. That's a lot of people. You know what I really want to go see is Atlanta United. The soccer team. Yeah, yes. they're pretty good. I, I've heard. They're right around the corner and I've yet to go. So I'm super pumped to go see them You should see go them see them. They're right pretty there. good. I don't like soccer, but I have heard that they are pretty good. Well, here's my question. So what if we build a stage for you, put a big B in the 50-yard line? But, you know, I put this gigantic B or maybe it's not a B. Maybe it's just a circular s- stage. And I, and I hand over a microphone to you. Again, 78,000. 347 people. What do you say to them in that moment? And maybe it's people that have family members that have come out and that are now part of the, again, big umbrella community. And they're struggling with what they've now heard, much like your mom did many years ago, much like your dad sounds like didn't, but kind of did maybe on some level. What do you say to them in that moment? Well, I probably would maybe lead off with what I just told you. Stories matter more, but statistics help. Bring a little sobriety and reality to the situation that there's a large group of people that have felt hurt and rejected by the church and have been and or feel that way. There's all stories within there, but it's a real thing. And you don't have to go far to validate that an LGBTQ plus friend or family member that would share their story with you. So you don't have to convince people that that's true. So the question is from there, who do you know? Because like the best way to stress test our theology is through people. So like usually people that are pretty adamant about the six verses in the Bible and don't really care about maybe the other part of the conversation about what role can we play in healing and reconciliation. I usually ask them, how many gay people do you really know? (laughs) It's good to get out there and just to know our stories, just to know our experiences and let that inform your heart and your theology. It's not a slippery slope type of proposition here. All of our theology should be stress tested by experience and by people. It all should fit together. And so usually I just encourage people to just know our stories, just just be willing to be in the room and to hear a, a a story of an LGBTQ plus person that felt really hurt and rejected within the church and is turned off to God because of it. And just let that impact your head and your heart. Because I think when we have empathy, then we have a better sense of kind of the whole landscape. Not the noisy people in the headlines, not that person in the Bud Light, Bud Light commercial you were talking about. They're they're anomalies. They're, they're so the minority. There's a whole sea of people in the quieter middle there that you never hear about in the headlines. Probably would love to, if they could trust you, could tell you their story of hurt. And you might in that moment get a little sense of like, you know what, I may not agree with you on this, but I care about that thing that happened to you. That's what I'm talking about. I love the care about what happened to you because I think, again, so many times, I think the conversation is so focused on what has happened, not how you're going to fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's powerful. Do you feel like in your heart of hearts, you were maybe born this way? No, oh, good question. The, the big question, nature or nurture? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I, I think it's a, to me, you know, I'm kind of, I've kind of moved on from that for me personally, but I think for other people, it's probably a combination of all of the above. Maybe I have genetic predispositions to be whatever. Maybe they've proven that. Maybe they haven't. I doubt it. I don't really get hung up on that. I think it's a combination of how you're born and and what, what experiences have you had. I was the youngest of three boys. Felt like I couldn't keep up with my big brothers. I didn't feel like I fit in with the guys. And so I'm sure that played a part as well. So I don't know. I, I I always think it's sort of a combination of nature versus nurture. Yeah. I mean, I've just heard that through the years is, is that people say, yeah. well, you know, I was born this way and, and Lady Gaga yeah. had a great song about it. I was born this way. I'm like, well, were you though? I don't know. That That's the hard part for me. And again, it's that's their experience. So that's the way that I sort of invite or challenge people is let people have their own experience. Their experience. If somebody says, hey, listen, I completely don't agree with everything that you're saying. You're wrong. You're you're sinful. And they want to come at you with the Judge Wapner gown and gavel. Judge Wapner. That's right. People score. That's right. Oh, that's so I great. You, yeah. Dude, we got to hang, we gotta we hang gotta out hang sometimes, out sometimes like, right? Do all these I I know. I just draw, draw them up from our past. <laughs> they want to come at you with that. Yep. What's your? I get some of. I get some the of that. vitriol, the disdain. Yeah. What's your response is generally to that? I stop talking to them. You know, I don't really have time for that, and it's okay. Like it's well, it's not okay. That extreme example is not okay. <laughs> it's not okay for anything. 
hopefully that person would look in the mirror and try to figure out where the heck that's coming from. But I really don't have time have for that. Have you experienced I, I mean, any of that in any churches or anything like that you've gone to? You know, surprisingly, no. It's weird. There's there's just been a whole lot of favor for this project in some ways. I mean, probably on the front end, maybe. You know, if we've ever done any kind of like advertising or something where people don't get to know me, they just kind of see the message first and they might react to that. But generally speaking, no, I don't. I really respect that people come from a lot of different places on this from a theological standpoint. And that matters. That's important. I got to eat my own cooking, right? If I'm asking them to empathize with me, understand my hesitations and hurdles, I got to understand theirs too. Pretty quickly, I invite them to move on from that to talk about what we are talking about. And this is about empathy. And do you want to be a part of healing and reconciliation and the solution? And to agree to disagree on that stuff. If the answer is yes, we're all in. If the answer is no, then I just move on. It's okay. I have this thing I call the quieter middle. All I mean by that is like there's people in the extremes on the subject of really progressive or really conservative, and they've kind of of got their heels dug in. And that's what we kind of see in, in the news and the headlines. But the reality is the vast majority of us are somewhere in the middle trying to figure this thing out. We may lean a little more towards conservative or more progressive. We're in the middle wanting to try to figure out how to love and engage and communicate with each other better. That's where most of us live. That's sort of my audience. So I really don't get a whole lot of vitriol. And if I do, I usually just kind of move on. I just don't have time to try to convince them otherwise. I mean, I would just imagine some of the louder voices in some churches perhaps would say, well, man, you're you're sinning. You're you're completely indulging in sin and you're a sinful person. And I, I just would imagine... Maybe that's come across your plate or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, if I, you know, Google search me, then there's a lot of people that say those things. You know, I just, I really... Whoa, you Google search yourself and people are saying that? Again, I just, I feel like, what am I going to do? Am I going to spend my energy trying to prove them wrong? Like they're trying to prove me wrong? Or am I going to do the work of the kingdom, the ministry of healing and reconciliation? That is what I'm about. That's what I give my time and attention to. When you die Mm -hmm. and Brian's no more, Mm -hmm. what legacy would you like others to say? Ah, legacy. That's a good word. I think that I would have helped more folks feel at home with God and to know God and to know grace to, I mean, I really care about the mission of what I'm doing with, you know, especially with conservative churches that, and again, I'm not trying to change their theology. I'm just trying to help them change their priorities. And the younger generation has forced it here. Churches can't afford to not have proactive conversations about this stuff. They can't. Just where we're at. And so trying to help them do that in a way that's productive and and is honoring to their own theology, really looking at sort of practices here versus positions. You know, if I can help that along in a way that honors God and and honors the church and helps more LGBTQ plus folks experience the love of God, that would be a great legacy. You get to heaven. I'm guessing that's where you think your destination is. Christians are looking looking for. Yeah. What do you think he says to you? Uh, Probably say something like, well done, good and faithful servant. If he said it to me more in my language, He'll probably tip his hat to me for taking a risk. Faith is not about what's known. It's about what's unknown. And when I hit that crossroads and had that wrestling match for a couple of years and came out feeling like I heard God saying, you don't have to keep working on fixing your sexuality, which many folks may not agree with. That's what I discerned. And I went down this new path. I wasn't sure at all. Like I just had to kind of put one foot in front of the other and really just trust God. And it opened up a whole new sort of definition of what faith is for me. It's not about what's known. It's about what's unknown. And and really just had to be comfortable with the uncertainty of what I was doing. And that just opened up a whole new, deeper relationship and picture of God. And now that I'm on the other side of that, I'm like, wow, what I was missing out on, but I was so afraid to take a step out on something that I wasn't so sure about. And I think he's going to honor me for that. Toughest part of that wrestling match was what? I had to go back and unwind stuff. I really felt like to that, just in all vulnerability here, I really felt like up to that point, what I was doing was honoring God to not act on my sexuality. And so if I was going to make a a paradigm shift around that, I had to really go backwards and look at what was God and what wasn't. That was tough. That was was a tough unwinding to kind of go back and and to fit. And I figured it out, but that's why it took a couple of years for me to, to be at peace with God about this. I didn't need to be right. I didn't even need to have a slick new interpretation of six verses. I needed to be at peace with God and with myself. And that that took a while. So what role does the Bible play in your life? Um, the Bible. 
it's the foundation of the Christian faith. It's a touch point, personal touch point for me. I remember when I was in that wrestling match, you would think that because of my mom, a lot of my relationship with God is relational, experiential, right? But it's still based in the Bible too. So when I was at that crossroads, I'm like, well, I got to figure out the Bible part. Like I can't just pretend the Bible doesn't exist. And so I kind of sought out the Bible with a new sense of urgency. And I went to the places where you might expect that I would go, these six or seven verses about that speak to sexuality. And I look at progressive interpretations of that. I look at conservative interpretations of that. I look inside my own head and I, mean, I couldn't resolve it. Sure. Like every argument seemed a worthwhile argument, cultural context, whatever. So I really felt like God just say, well, why don't you come over here? And I went to the gospels and I went to the book of John. Because I had remembered that, oh, I really like the rendering of John. It felt like more of a personal kind of intimate rendering. And I did the study of the book of John for a couple of months, and I still have all my notes. And that's where I saw with new eyes the life of Jesus and how who he talked to and who he didn't and what he cared about and what he didn't and how salvation is simple. And if you trust me, we're good. Just really got deep in my being that nothing can separate me from the love of God. And I just got a whole new and deeper appreciation for the reality of, of God and grace. And, and that's when I knew at a heart level, even if I got this wrong, we're good. That's kind of what settled it for me in the Bible. I appreciate you sharing that. I would love, maybe, and this didn't happen, I don't know, I would have loved to have heard a section or a passage of scripture where you're like, you know, hey, this is where I kind of feel like I fell mm -hmm. at peace with this situation. Book of John, life of Jesus, the big picture. Well, it just kind of more the big pictures, you know, and I don't mean to minimize the, the scriptural piece of it. A lot of people need to wrestle with that. Even like folks that aren't LGBTQ+, plus, that really this concept of making things right and inviting them into healing and reconciliation, all of that resonates with them. However, <laughs> unless they can really wrestle with the Bible and, and make sense of some things, at least to agree to disagree, they're probably never going to be able to enter into that. So, I, so the Bible piece is super important. And there's brilliant theologians that tackle this subject in new ways. And it's good to, it's good to look at that stuff. It's again, it's stress tested to your own belief system when you can look at alternate ways of looking at the Bible. Does it have ultimate authority in your life, the Bible? I don't really know what that means. That, that's sort of a sure, but I, I don't know. It, 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 I don't really resonate with that statement. And I think of authority in my life. Who has ultimate authority in my life? Who's ultimately in charge of it? Who speaking into my life to point at directions when I'm out of bounds or when I'm wrong in an yep. area? Or maybe I've been cruel to my wife or I've been mean to my daughter or I've gossiped about a coworker. Who knows? Who has that ultimate authority to say, Neil, you were wrong in this yeah. area. You need to get back in line. So that's why I'm saying I think the Bible for me does that. And that's why I was curious if it, if you feel the same in that regard. That's awesome. And we're probably only like 20 degree difference there because the author, and you would probably say this too, but the author of that has the final say in my life. And the Bible points to that. Absolutely. The living word is has the ultimate authority inside of me. And the written word is 100% consistent with that. It's just sometimes our heads get in the way and we can't figure it out. And so we have to use the spirit to really know what it's saying to us. Well, Brian, I want to give you an opportunity right now. If, if again, someone's hearing you, someone's curious about more than, than we could cover. I mean, we could probably go all day. I feel like we have such an amazing chemistry. Just so you know, you asked really good, brave questions. You really did. I love that. When we were prepping everybody, he was talking about his hesitancy and he put it out there. And I said, good for you, man. Like if you honor and respect where I'm coming from, even if we disagree, you can't say anything wrong. And you asked like really kicking questions. So good for you. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I pride myself on being a pretty good interviewer. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank no, you so much. I, I appreciate that wholeheartedly. For you, back to you. If folks are hearing you and they want to continue this conversation, or maybe they have questions again that we couldn't get to, because again, yeah. we only have so much time and we could go all day probably, I feel like. Here's where I'm at. If someone wants to continue that conversation, maybe offline, that's the kind of synergized <laughs> word nowadays, offline or in other avenues, how can they do that? And what's the best way someone can connect with you? I would say if you're sort of in that camp that you want to debate, don't bother <laughs> contacting me. <laughs> but if you're if you're in that proverbial quieter middle that I'm talking about, and you can even be incredibly conservative, this proposition of being a part of healing and reconciliation for the LGBTQ plus community is specifically in regards to their faith in God and their hurts from the past is is a curiosity to you. Makingthingsright.org. It's a pretty straightforward deal. You, you won't be offended. <laughs> you may not always agree. But I think you can tell from this podcast, I and the people that I collaborate with are respecters of 
lots of different theologies. That's not the end game. We did a podcast. There's a couple things there. I wrote a white paper. You might ask what the heck a white paper is. It meant I didn't have time to write a book. So it's a 15 page thesis about what making things right is about. We unpacked that into a podcast mini series. So we had seven episodes that we released a year ago. So between the podcast and the white paper, and then, you know, there's some resources there if you want to be curious, but that might be a good place to start. I was actually wondering about the white paper. So I'm glad you clarified that because I was like, what is a white paper? I I was on the site. It's a very corporate term. I just had never heard that. I think the technical definition of white paper is it presents a problem, point of view or a position that you have. It proposes solutions, academic type of terminology. Hopefully it's not a boring academic paper. (laughs) It presents these statistics that I talked about. It presents stories of LGBTQ plus people. It presents stories of parents whose kids came out and had to reconcile their conservative beliefs and loving their kids. And it sort of invites you into what does making things right look like. Brian, we do this thing at the end of the show. It's called senseless. It's this senseless, silly thing we do at the end of the show. There's no prizes. But I have a cup and a die and we roll the die that's in the cup and it is a North Carolina cup. I feel like this is wasted because you're not a sports guy. But I'm a... I- I'm a Neil guy. I'm a Neil fan. Okay, well, there you go. It's all right. If you like... Are you team Neil? I'm so team Neil. Oh, finally! Yes! My wife and I have this thing that goes back and forth. Like, everybody's team Elizabeth. And there's one of my friends in my friend group. His name's Dave. And he actually, for my birthday, wrote team Neil on a a shirt and wore it to my birthday party in light blue because he knows I love light blue. I'm going to roll because you didn't... I mean, you brought a cup, but no die, I heard, right? All right. No die. It's random. That's why we use the die. I have no idea where this is going. All right, number three is is this. You can see that, right? Number three. three. It's a light blue three even. So here we are. Number three is this. Three items you must grab in a fire. Three things? Yes, three things you would grab in a fire. (sighs) My husband. Sorry, I'm married. (laughs) No, I'm not sorry, but you know, your listeners might not like that. Too bad. He's a really good dude, though. You would like him. I grabbed Dan. Well, he probably grabbed me. I grabbed Keela. I have a two-year-old Weimaraner puppy who is so freaking cute. And I call her a puppy because, like, she stopped growing at, like, 40 pounds. So we got the runt, and she's so cute. So Dan and Keela, obviously my family. And then what's the third thing? My favorite bottle of red wine. Because <laughs> I probably have, like, an epic bottle waiting for a special occasion. And if I knew that that went up in flames, I'd be so sad. Again, I want to say thank you so much for for giving us a moment today. Really appreciate your time. Thank you for that. My pleasure. Well, guys and gals, kids and campers alike, you know what that sound means. That is it. That is all. That is our show today. So what are you walking away with? What's your takeaway? There's so many to choose from. So let me try to rein in my thoughts here. I'm going to take you back to a moment. I wasn't there, but I've been there a few times in my mind. There's a scene in the Bible that is one of my favorites. And it's this woman. It's kind of famous, actually. It's this woman that's caught in the act of adultery. And so in my mind, this is how it goes. She is drug from the act. They barely let her grab a sheet and they drug her through the streets and people are yelling and screaming and throwing things and maybe even spitting. And see, Jesus is there with his disciples and they throw her down on the ground at his feet. And they said, teacher, we've caught this woman in the act of adultery. What are we to do with her? And Jesus doesn't say a word. Instead, he bends down and he writes something on the ground. Now, to this day, as a curious interviewer as I am, man, I want to know what he wrote. And they persist. Teacher, what do we do? And he stands up and he says, those of you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And he bends down on the ground again. He writes again on the ground again. Again, what the heck is he writing? And the scripture actually says, it started with the older and then to the younger. They drop their rocks and they leave. Now, listen, I'm not saying Brian's in sin. I'm not saying that. I'm going to let you interpret that. I'm just going to ask you, if he is, and I'm going to air quote that, what do you do with that story? The end of that story, Jesus stoops down again, looks at the woman, and he says to her, daughter, go and sin no more. What do you do with that? What do you do with the hurting? What do you do with the ones that are marginalized, that are not seen? What do you do with those ones. How do you help them unveil that mask that they've been wearing for so many years? How do you do that? What do you do with that? That's your question and that's your challenge. Let me know. OPSpodcast.com. Great place to let me know. OPS Podcast Show on the socials. Remember this. Remember when you walk in other people's shoes, you really do get a different perspective on life. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned till next week when we walk in other people's shoes.